Ready to go? All right. Let's get going. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Just uh, this is a little poem, a little bit of a banjo Patterson poem. Just read that. Just let that into your into your soul a little bit. Let it really affect you. It's a very important poem for this show. This is a story about a man who has died more than once. Death number one, pregnant on the roof. So when my mum was heavily pregnant with me, I was due on any day. She awoke in the middle of this stormy night in the middle of our farm in rural South Australia. And she woke in the middle of this stormy night. It was pouring with rain. And she woke to my dad, shaking her awake. And she woke up and my dad, said to, my dad said, I need you to climb up on the roof. The plastic has come off the hole in the roof and we need to pull the plastic on. The water's coming in and it's ruining the kitchen. And my mum said, I'm, I'm pregnant. I am due on any day now. And he said, I know, but it's a two-person job. I need to do it. It's ruining the kitchen. And so my mum climbed out of bed, followed my dad out into the darkness. As my dad put the ladder up against the edge of the, the roof in the rain, he pushed my mum up to the very top <laughs> of the ladder, climbed up the ladder behind her, and then pushed her by the legs to the very peak of the roof where my mum grabbed the plastic, pulled it over the hole, and put the brick on the plastic. And she turned around, and my whole dad's whole upper half of his body was just standing on top of the ladder above the roof, and he just gave her the two thumbs up. <laughs> and as he did this, my mum heard the sound of the ladder scraping on the wet concrete below in the darkness and she saw the whole upper half of my dad's body just bounce off the side of the roof and fall with a crash into the darkness below. And my mum called out to my dad, my dad's name is Ray, she said, Ray, Ray! And there was no answer. She yelled out again, Ray, Ray! Still no answer. She waited a couple of minutes, Ray, Ray! Still no answer. She waited three hours. Ray. Ray. Still no answer. I was born on that roof. And when my mum gave birth to me, she used the umbilical cord to lower me down the side of the roof and as I hit the gutter the umbilical cord snapped and I fell down onto my dad's lifeless body on the ground below and as I landed on my dad's chest he awoke <laughs> and he held me in his hands and he looked at me in my eyes and he said we shall call you John <laughs> without an H <laughs> it shall be said slightly quicker than John with an H none of this John stuff and then he closed his eyes and died. That's not true. This would be a very quick show if that was true. Uh, he uh, broke about uh, nine ribs and was knocked unconscious. He awoke four hours later, put the ladder up, got my mum off the roof, and my mum and dad were bed partners in hospital. My dad getting treated for bro broken ribs and a bad concussion, and my mum giving birth to me a couple of days later. So. Here's my dad here, he's a very tanned man, and, uh, and that's because he's always out in the Australian sun, always out working on the farm in this tiny little area that we grew up in, and, and this, this very, very serious man just growing up on this tiny little farm. And, and the farm that we, we grew up on, uh, it was a dust farm that we had, and there's my mum <laughs> and my dad there, and uh, it was a good year for dust this year, we made a lot of money on the, on the dust crops, but... Uh, but we didn't just grow dust on this tiny little farm that we grew up on, uh, we also grew rocks and uh, sadness, and pigs. We mainly had pigs on, the, on this tiny little farm in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and we grew up on this tiny little farm. I'll go to a more recent photo. This is me and my family, my three older brothers and my mum there in the middle. And this is the best family photo I could find. Out of all of our family photos, us at uh, my brother Ralph's wedding. And, uh, and even in this photo, my, my brother Chris is still managing to fuck this one up by being a dick. And, uh, and Tim's not even looking at the camera. But this is the best one I could find of my whole family. And there's my dad up the back there looking very, very serious. He's a very, very serious serious man. You can get a close-up of Chris being a dick there as well. And, uh, <laughs> my dad is a very serious man. He's a pillar of the community in this tiny little community that we grew up on and, uh, and it's a very serious man. When I was about, probably when I was about six years old, uh, one of my favourite things to do was to tell jokes. I used to like to tell knock-knock jokes. And my dad called me over when I was six years old. He sat me on his knee and he looked at me in my eyes and he said, you need to stop telling knock-knock jokes. And I said, why? And he said, because they're offensive to homeless people. 
That's how serious this man is. A, very, a very serious and, and stern man. And I had to work with this man. Me and my brothers, we always worked with my dad out on the farm because uh, my dad was, was the local pig farmer in this tiny little community. But he wasn't just a, a pig farmer. My dad was this dominant man. He dominated every aspect of my life. So I had to work with him on the pig farm most days after school and everything like that. But he wasn't just a pig farmer in this tiny little community. He was also uh, my school teacher. And I don't mean a teacher at my school. I mean my fucking teacher. Has anyone yeah. had the, their parent be your teacher before? It is horrible. The kids don't like you because your dad is the, the teacher and, and everything like that. And this was a horrible experience. The only joy I got out of this is uh, in, in, in the mornings at school when, when dad would walk into the classroom and all the kids would be sitting on the carpet and, and dad would walk into the classroom and say, good morning, class. And all the kids in unison would sing, good morning, Mr. Bennett and I got to go good morning dad and then I look at all the kids and laugh and they hated my fucking guts for this reason <laughs> So I saw my dad every day at school from Monday to Friday and then after school I'd have to work on the pig farm and everything like that and uh, but he wasn't just my school teacher either. He was also the bus driver. See, he would pick me up from my house, drive me to school, and drop me off in the afternoon. And my, my dad refused to give me any special treatment as my teacher or my bus driver or anything like that. And even when I would say, you know, good morning, dad, he would come up, he'd call me over and say, you do not call me dad. You call me Mr. Bennett like everyone else. You are just another kid at this school. You get no favoritism, no special treatment whatsoever. You call me Mr. Bennett. I had to call my own dad Mr. Bennett. And this was very hard, and even on the bus as well. Like, I'd get on the bus from our house, and he'd say, uh, welcome to the bus, young man. Find your seat safely and I go fuck dad you know who I am you're picking me up from our house what is, what is going on and this is very confusing for me so all I had were weekends all I had were weekends and they were my respite from dad and uh, and on Sundays me and my family would go to church dad was the minister at the local church and even at church would all go off to Sunday school and dad would shake my hand as the minister and just say did you enjoy the sermon young man I go fuck dad it's Sunday you know who I am but no special treatment, just another kid in Sunday school. And uh, anyway, all these things as well. So all I had were, was Saturday. Saturdays were my days off from dad. And all you do when you grow up in rural South Australia on Saturdays is play sports. Dad was my football coach, my basketball coach, and my tennis coach. He was everything in my life. He dominated my life. He was my uncle. He wasn't really my uncle, but he was everything in my life. This very, very serious man and the, and the reason he's looking so serious in this in this photo is because the photo preceding this one is uh, is this the entire family doing the double finger at my brother's wedding and uh, and my dad hates this photo he'd hate that I would show this photo in 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 this show and uh, and even after this photo of course my dad is the only one not doing it in, in this photo even my little mum in the middle there is, is really giving it a go and and uh, my dad would hate this photo and even after this photo was taken my uncle who took the photo he said uh, Ray you ruined that photo. <laughs> but dad would hate this. He says he's never, my dad says he's never pulled the finger in his entire life. And in fact, my dad says he's never said a swear word in his entire life. Now, can any of us say we've never said a swear word before? No, yeah. we're normal people. It's a great way to release frustration and, and anger and everything. And my dad gets very angry and, and very frustrated and everything like that. And I would talk to him and I'd say, how is it possible, dad, that you have never said a swear word? And he always had the same answer. And that was, there are other words you can use. <laughs> And I'm not kidding, I've seen my dad walk around the back of the car at night time and hit his shin so fucking hard on the tow bar of the car that he has fallen down to his knees in the darkness, raised his fists, looked up at the moon and just yelled, CURSES! He yells curses! Like a Scooby-Doo villain, he yells curses! These are the other words my dad uses. And the other thing he would do is he'd just, he'd just yell his feelings. That's, that's what he would do. So he'd just be out working on the farm somewhere and we'd just hear him scream, I'm angry! <laughs> I'm annoyed! I'm upset! Just, just yelling his feelings. They're the other things he did when, when he was instead of swearing. And the other thing we'd hear him call out from, for, uh, on the farm because we always thought Dad was dying growing up. We always thought he was going to die and, uh, and that's because he'd be out on the farm just working on something on the farm and he'd just release this blood-curdling scream for help. And so we'd, we'd just be out, we'd be sitting in the lounge room just watching TV or something like that and we'd just say this, Help me please! Somebody help me please! I need some help! I need some help now please! Please somebody come quickly! I need some help! And my mum and my brother's mum would just go, go! And me and my brothers would disperse onto the farm, just running out trying to find Dad following these screams for help. And sure enough, I'd run into the shed and there would be Dad and he'd be under the tractor. 
And I think, oh God, something's happened. The tractor's rolled onto Dad or something like that. And I go, Dad, Dad, are you okay? And then I see a hand poke out from under the tractor. And he'd just say, can you just pass me that spanner there? <laughs> so he legitimately needs help. And, the, and that's why he screams for help. And, to, and this is an earlier photo of me and Dad and, and Tim Bucktooth, my, my brother there. We, we called it. <laughs> We called him Tim Bucktooth because he because he had the he had the teeth and uh, and I can call him that because he was a, he was a horrible bully to me growing up one of those older siblings that, that picked on me I used to like playing Super Nintendo and every time I played Super Nintendo in my room Tim would put his dick in my ear and it was a horrible <laughs> thing for him to do so I think calling him Tim Bucktooth is fine that's that's, that's fair enough for that and uh, but that's what this show is about I, I'm going to go through some of the deaths that affected me growing up that my dad because I always thought he was he was dying or dead growing up and uh, and I'm going to take you through some of the more significant deaths that affected me during around this time. So, deaths number one, four, five, eight, and ten. My dad has fallen off a ladder on five separate occasions. <laughs> occasions. And, uh, and the first time, I was, of course, when I was born a couple of days later, but I don't really remember the one, that one. The only other one I remember is, uh, is when I was probably about ten years old and I was, I was sitting in the kitchen uh, playing Super Nintendo because my parents moved the Super Nintendo to the kitchen because if I played in my room, Tim would put his dick in my ear. So my parents were like, yo, that's how we'll deal with that problem. Let's just move the Super Nintendo. Don't do anything about Tim. Don't, don't do anything about him molesting his brother by putting his dick in his ear. Just move the Super Nintendo. That's what we'll do. And uh, so I was sitting in the kitchen playing Super Nintendo, playing my favourite game, NBA Jam. And I was sitting in the kitchen just, just playing the game and, and, and Dad was in the kitchen trying to put a picture up on the wall. And, uh, and he was trying to hammer this nail into the wall, but he's a shorter man like me, so it was just, just out of his reach and he was getting very angry because he was screaming, I'm angry. And, uh, and he was jumping and trying to hit the, hit the nail at the same time and it kept falling down and he was getting very angry, just screaming, I'm angry all the time. Uh, and, then I, and then I heard him just go outside and drag the ladder into the kitchen. And then he put the ladder up against the kitchen wall at an angle like that. And then attempted to walk up the rungs of this ladder. And even as like a little nine-year-old kid, I was just like, no, no. Boom shakalaka. And I just sat there playing the game and then I heard that familiar sound of the ladder scraping down the kitchen wall and I spun in my chair to see my dad fall in between the rungs of the ladder. He landed with a crash on the ground. His legs went out on right angles. Blood started spurting from his knees as he lay there with a crash on the ground, just mangulated into this ladder. I couldn't see where the ladder started and dad stopped. He just crashed on the ground and he said nothing. Now this is a man who screams for help and he stays completely silent. And I turn around and just see him mangled into this ladder and I say, oh shit, dad, are you okay? And he holds out a hand and just says, there's no need for that language. <laughs> and I go, dad, are you okay? Are you okay? There's blood coming from me. He's like, I don't know what he goes, go in the other room. Leave me here. <laughs> just leave me here. And I run into the lounge room and my mom has heard the crash and she's running out into the kitchen. I say, no, no, no. He says, it's going to be okay. We just have to leave him where he, where he is. And then mom and I just sit in the lounge room in silence as we hear dad yell more of his feelings in the kitchen, just yelling, I'm hurt. I'm embarrassed. I'm annoyed. I've made a fool of myself. Just yelling more of his feelings for an hour. And then he walks into the lounge room with his two giant bandages around each knee, just, just blood soaking through the bandages. And he says nothing. And we say nothing. And we never speak of this again. <laughs> Until now. <laughs> so we constantly thought he was dying growing up. He had a, he had a shark attack and, uh, he, uh, and this was when he was a younger man. He was out spear fishing out in, in the ocean uh, off the coast of South Australia and he was spearing these fish and then putting these dead bloody fish into a hessian sack tied around his ankle, <laughs> leaving a trail of blood out into the Australian Ocean and he was swimming in towards the jetty with his spear and this trail of blood and all these sharks followed the trail and just attached this sack around his, his ankle and all the fishermen on the jetty are waving and pointing and Dad just looked up at the fishermen and gave them a little word. <laughs> He started three bushfires, he's burned our entire farm down on three separate occasions. <laughs> if he does it again, the, the fire brigade has said he will be arrested. <laughs> he had a heart attack, that was one of the more scary ones, but I'm pretty sure he got it from holding in swear words. I'm pretty sure that was, that's the sort of stress that that sort of thing creates. 
Then as a family, we would, we would go, uh, once a month, we'd go into the city for, for a special meal to a restaurant or something like that, me and my brothers and my, and my mom and dad, and we're in this Chinese restaurant when I was probably about eight years old, and, uh, and we hadn't even ordered food yet, and dad just took a little sip of his soda water, put it down, then reeled back in his seat and died. <laughs> and they had to call the paramedics and everything like that. The paramedics had to come in and revive my dad because he had choked on the bubbles in the fucking soda water. <laughs> Who chokes on the bubbles in soda water? He would do the exact same thing 15 years later on a packed train in Melbourne. We were on this packed train and dad just took a little sip of his coke and then just died there on the train. And mum and I had to lift him off of the train at the next stop, lay him down on the bench and all the people on this packed train were just staring at us and everything like that. And then as the doors dinged and closed and the train went to take off from the station, dad sat up. And he gave all the people looking at him a little wave. Then when I, was, uh, when I was about nine years old, uh, Dad stopped being my teacher for a year and that's because he got this nearly fatal disease that you get from accidentally drinking pig urine. This is a real disease. <laughs> it's called leptospirosis. It's a real disease. And I grew up in this farming community, so all the, all the kids at school were like, where's Mr. Bennett gone? And I go, oh, he's got leptospirosis. And they go, oh, the, piss, the pig piss drinking disease. Does he have that one, does he? He was a very supportive man of me growing up, my dad, and he always asked that good question that, that good dads do, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And when I was about this age, I always had the same answer, and that was a king. I would like to be a king, please, that's what I would like to be when I grow up. <laughs> and dad would, I'd tell dad this, and he'd go, oh, I don't know, that's not really a realistic choice for you, I don't know if you know who I am, but that's not really going to happen. I'd say, dad, you quite often believe, pretend you don't know who I am. And, uh, <laughs> And he said, no, 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 that's, that's not really what you should be. But I was, I was obsessed with sort of royalty at this young age. And I used to write and make these books, these three-page books. One was called The King and the Boomerang. Uh, the King finds a boomerang on the first page. He throws the boomerang on the second page, third page, the end. That was the book that I made. And I'd stapled them together and I made all these little books. And Dad would read these books. And then, uh, and then he would encourage me and say, maybe you should be a writer. Maybe you'd be interested in being a writer like the famous Australian poet Banjo Patterson. Now, Dad loved these old bush poets, these old poets from, from many years ago, and, uh, and I didn't really know who Banjo Patterson was at this age, and, and I asked my dad, and he said, he's the man on the $10 note. And, uh, and I thought to myself at this age, I thought, you know who's got a lot of $10 notes? Kings. And so whenever Dad would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say, a Banjo Patterson. I would like to be one of them, please. <laughs> I didn't really know who Banjo Patterson was, but this is who my dad was trying to encourage me to be like. These old bush poets like, like Henry Lawson. Dad loved Henry Lawson and the, these old poets, and he had all these books and everything. And, and this is Banjo Patterson here from the, from the $10 note. And then Dad loved Banjo Patterson. This is the person he sort of wanted me to, to be. And uh, for those of you who might not know who Banjo Patterson is, I'll, uh, I'll show you one of Banjo's poems. All the tried and noted riders from the stations near and far had mustered at the homestead overnight. For the bushmen love hard riding where the wild bush horses are, and the stock horse snuffs the battle with delight. Every poem is about horses. Every single fucking poem is about horses. And they go forever and they don't rhyme. You know what a, a poem is that goes forever and doesn't rhyme? It's a story, Banjo. You can't pass that off as poetry. <laughs> But this is who my dad wanted me to be. This is what we, he wanted me to aspire to be. So when I started getting this show ready, I remembered this. And, uh, and so I decided I would, I would go to some poetry nights. And I started going to some poetry nights in, in Melbourne. Has anyone been to any, any poetry nights before? Anyone? No one's been to one? I think you have. Did any of the poems rhyme at the poetry night? No. No. None of the poems rhyme at the poetry night. I went to a poetry night in Melbourne. Two hours of non-rhyming poems. And I thought, that's easy. So I've written some poems for this show. Can I just get you to give me a hand with this? I'm not going to make fun of you. Can you just come up and help me with this? Listen to this. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. There you go. So I've written some, some uh, traditional bush poetry for this show after going to these, these poetry nights and uh, I hope you enjoy them because this is what my, my dad wanted me to be when I grew up. <laughs> 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 
This is a traditional Australian hat. For those of you who don't know, this is what the, the Bushmen and everyone, they, they will wear these out in the hot Australian sun. And uh, for those of you who do know, what are the, what are the corks hanging from the strings there for? Stop the flies from buzzing in your face. That's what the corks are there for. <laughs> Guess what's more annoying <laughs> than flies buzzing in your face? <laughs> Fucking giant corks just constantly hitting you in the face. If anything, they're more consistently in your face <laughs> than flies. Good invention, Australia. Well done. It's like you're being teabagged by corks. So I've written a special poem for tonight because it's Valentine's Day. I've written, I've written a poem about something I care deeply about. It's a poem about love. So if you're here with a loved one, just put your, put your arm around them. It's, it's something I care deeply about almost as much as Banjo cares about horses. So I've, I've written a poem for this. Uh, it's a love poem. It's called, uh, When I First Had Sex, I Tried to Put My Balls In. <laughs> It's a love poem. <laughs> love, what is love? Love is a battlefield. No. Can you feel a battlefield? Do you ever say to yourself, I think I'm in battlefield with Wendy? No. Pat Benatar is wrong. Love is a many wondrous thing. Love lifts you up, we belong. All you need is love. Not really. Love is one thing, a feeling. Love grabs you with its pincers and holds you until you're subdued. And then when you are subdued, it brings its tail around and it stings you and it stings you and it stings you and it stings you and it stings you. It's just a scorpion metaphor. All you need is love. Except if you really are dying, then you might need a little bit more than love. Perhaps some medicine. Love doesn't make you money unless you're a prostitute, but isn't there prostitutes in love unless they kiss you on the lips and have sex for you for free? <laughs> Pretty woman. <laughs> what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. <laughs> don't hurt me. No more. <laughs> Although when you go to the poetry and I saw the audience do it, they click their fingers. It's fucking weird. Okay. Uh, <laughs> sounds like crickets or something like that. But, uh, but every time you think you, your dad is dying, it's not, it's not like the boy who cried wolf. You don't, you don't not believe it after the first time. If it's someone you love, you think it's happening every single time. And every single time it happens, you go through all these moments in your life where you were not a good son, or you didn't live up to his expectations, or you disappointed him in some way. So just to show you what this is like, I'm going to take you through a few of these, which I've called Disappointing Dad. Disappointing Dad number three, the Jive Bunny Dance. And so this happened when I was about this age. I was probably about seven years old when, uh, when mum and dad moved Tim and I to a new school. And we started going to this new school, just one a bit further down the road from us. And, uh, and of course, lucky, luckily enough for me, Dad became my fucking teacher again. They thought, keep him with the same teacher. He should be with the same teacher. And Dad was my teacher again. And this made it very hard for me to make friends at this, this new school. And Tim was putting his dick in people's ears and things like this. It made it very hard for me to make friends at this new school. And, uh, and the kids, they would tease me and, and make fun of me and everything like that. And, uh, uh, but they didn't tease me about what you would think they would tease me about. They didn't tease me about my height. Obviously, I was one of the smaller kids in class, but uh, they didn't tease me about this because I had comebacks for why I'm short, which I'd learned from the other school, and, uh, and I'd do these comebacks so, so the kids wouldn't tease me. And for years, I told people, I've got a, a hole in my heart, like Webster and Gary Coleman. And uh, then Lord of the Rings came out, I told everyone I was a, a hobbit. And, and, uh, and now I just told people I'm not really short, I'm just always in the distance. But this makes it very hard. This makes it extremely hard to get close to people and make friends at a new school. So, and so I didn't know what to do, so they didn't, but they didn't tease me about my height. Instead, they teased me about my name, John. And they would say, your parents can't afford an H in John. <laughs> There's not really a comeback that you can come up with for that and, and it really hurt me and I didn't know what to do and, and I was there for the first term and they announced at the end of the term that there was going to be a talent competition. And I thought, I'd been watching a lot of 80s movies and television, and I thought, if I do really well in this talent competition, that's how I win over all the kids at school. That's what I need to do. I need to do something spectacular at the talent competition, and I'll become a cool kid, and I'll win over all the kids at this new school. So I went up to my dad, who was the 
fucking host of the talent competition. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, Dad, I want to go in the talent competition. And, and he said, no, I don't think so. I think you're a bit too small for that. And I said, I'm not small. I've got a hole in my Harlow Webster and Garrett Coleman. <laughs> and he said, he said, no, don't stop telling people that. And, uh, and I said, I want to go in the talent competition. He said, well, what do you, you want to do? And I said, I want to do a dance. And he said, well, what kind of a dance? And I said, I want to do a break dance. Break dancing was very popular at the time. And, and he said, oh, OK, you can go on the talent competition, but you're going on first. You're going to be the first act. And I said, that's fine. That's fine. I'll be the first act. That's all I need. I just think, wow, over all the kids at school. In, in that, oh, that's all I need is, is just my chance. And so I got Tim to help me, and I got my neighbor, Ty, to help me. And we started practicing this break dance in Ty's living room. And we were practicing this break dance one day when Ty's sister, Lisa, saw us. And she walked into the living room and she said, oh, would you like me to choreograph this dance for you? And we said, yes, yes, please choreograph this dance. Because not, not only was Lisa one of the older kids at school, she was also one of the cool kids. And so I said, yes, yes, choreograph this dance for us. So then it went from us doing this awesome break dance to a song called Stutter Rap, which is about a rapper with a speech impediment. Yeah, that's a real song and a uh, pretty cool song. And uh, uh, to us dressed as rabbits <laughs> dancing to Jive Bunny. Now, I don't ever know if you know who Jive Bunny is, but it is not cool music. It is not cool music, and we're dressed as these bunny rabbits just bouncing around in the, in the living room, and, 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 and I say, this is not going to work. This is, this is not going to work. Uh, Tim, we, I need this. I need this. Tim, you fucking definitely need this. We, we need this. To, and, and so we started conspiring against Lisa. She was a real bitch. She gave us no creative control over the dance whatsoever. And uh, we started conspiring against her, and we decided we needed to do something spectacular that's going to win over all the kids in this talent competition. And we decided that spectacular thing was going to be a backflip. And this consisted of me holding Ty here and Tim here, holding their shoulders, then they would hold me by the feet and then flip me backwards and I'd land in the v bag in the living room every time. And it worked every time. We said, yes, this is what we're going to do in the talent competition to win over all the kids at school. So what I'm going to do now is reenact what happened at the talent competition. So I just need the house lights up and uh, you guys are all going to play the audience. You're going to play the audience of the talent competition. And uh, I'm not going to make fun of you or anything, but could you come up and help me? Could you come up and help me? Yeah, that would be great. Can I get you to help me as well? Please give them a round of applause. I'm not going to make fun of you or anything like that. What's your name? Pete and, and Alan. You're, you're, like, you're just going to play Ty and you're going to play Tim. Just stand either side of me here. So just stand over there. You'll be, you'll be fine. And it's very, very easy. I'm not going to make fun of you or make you do anything stupid. I just need you to wear that one. <laughs> and that one goes over your, over your ears, yep. I'm not gonna make fun of you, it's, it's, very, it's very easy. Yes, this is the same outfit I wore on the day. Yes, it still fits. So it's very, very easy. All you need to do is dance like you danced when you were six years old. If that involves just staring off at the lights at mum or, or looking down at the ground and doing that, that's fine. Do whatever you want to do. And then I'll say it's time for the backflip and we'll do the backflip, okay? Okay. And it's time to do some break dancing! We're starting to do some break dancing. All the kids in the audience, they started clapping to the music. And I thought, I'm doing it. I'm winning over the kids at school. I'm winning over the break dance. I'm going to do some more. Fuck you, Lisa. And the best men. Give me the best men. And the best men. I'm going to do the best men. All the kids in the audience, they all stood up and started clapping and dancing to the music. They all stood up and started clapping and dancing to the music. I'm gonna win them over! I'm doing it! I'm not gonna win anymore! I'm gonna win over the kids at school! I gotta do the backflip! And I grab Ty! And I grab Jim! And we did the backflip! Give my dancers a round of applause. <laughs> that was, that was, you were very gentle. I, I could tell that you were gentle people, and thank you so much for, for doing that. I even liked the little reassuring thing of, are we doing it? And I was like, yes, yes, we're, we're going to do it, because you know what? I've done this show a few times, and some guys just go, yep, he can do it, and just throw me in the back. So that's what happened. I, uh, I did the backflip, and I landed on my feet, and the, the audience went crazy, and I went over all the kids in the new school. 
Well, that's, that's what I wish happened. <laughs> nobody clapped, and nobody stood up and danced. And when it came time to do the backflip, instead of doing a backflip, I just sort of did this, <laughs> this you dive. <laughs> And I landed on my head on the stage. And I lay there and felt blood fill my <laughs> eyes and warmth. <laughs> and I did that cry that only little kid who's really hurt themselves does. You know that guttural, ah, 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 somebody get mum, somebody get mum. I had to call the, call the ambulance to take me away and I just remember dad walking out on stage and just going, this is over, this is over. And the talent competition got cancelled <laughs> after the first act. But I never got teased about not having an H in my name again. Just for being a little spazzo kid who knocked himself out <laughs> at the talent competition. Anybody celebrating a birthday? It's a poem I wrote for people when it's, when it's their birthday. It's called Happy Birthday. <laughs> birth. You were given birth. It took almost a whole day for your mother to push you out of her hole. She pushed out a human the size of a watermelon. Probably splitting her perineum and crapping herself in the process. Birth. Happy pushed out of your mama's whole day. <laughs> she wasn't happy. She was probably on drugs. Once you're out, she want to push you back in and do the whole thing again. It wasn't like masturbating with a baby-sized dildo. I said that the other night and a guy went Bleh. <laughs> Birth. You were pushed out of a very small hole on this day. Like a surprisingly beautiful yet massive poo. <laughs> Except from the other hole. You came out crying and covered in placenta. The doctor then smacked you and cut off the food tube that's been feeding you for nine whole months. I ask you, were you happy? <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Disappointing dad number 19, stand-up comedy. So when I turned about 18 years old, I, I started, I, I moved away. Farm life wasn't for me. I moved into the city and I started going to university and I started doing stand-up comedy. And, uh, and I kept this a secret from my mum and dad for quite a while because I, I knew they just weren't going to understand it well. And, and I, remember, I do remember my dad, this is true, just saying, uh, I don't like jokes. And I would say, well, what do you mean? He just said, I don't find them funny. <laughs> jokes is what he means, all jokes. And so I knew they wouldn't understand it, so I kept, them, kept it a secret from them for about nine months. And uh, then after a little while, my brother told them, and, uh, and my parents found out, and they decided they were going to surprise me by coming to one of my stand-up comedy shows. And Dad decided to buy a new video camera and record the event. And this is the result. What about you, mate? You have a pretty dick in a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going for? Do this. Hey, you want me to do that one? My brother put his dick in a vacuum cleaner. My brother's a bit strange. My brother used to walk out from the shower when he was about 15, you know, puberty times. Walk out, full on stiffy. Walk out. Mama tell him to put some clothes on and he'd just say it's big, isn't it, mate? Puberty is normally a tough time for us kids, isn't it? It's normally a rough time for us when we're teenagers. Boys, we start noticing girls. Girls, you start noticing boys. About three years older than us. <laughs> and you start noticing hair in really weird places. Like the soap. <laughs> Hair all over his 
fine. And he's bald on top. And uh, what we used to do was tell him to grow his shoulder hair really long and comb that up. <laughs> He never came to another show again. <laughs> so my parents now have a, a foster child and uh, they, got, they got her after all the other brothers left home and everything. And I, I don't know her very well because I'd moved away, but, uh, but they got this foster child and, and she's fine, like she's, she's, she's nice and everything like that. And uh, she's, now, she's now a bit older, she's probably about 19 or 20 now. And, and uh, she became my, my friend on Facebook and uh, that's fine. And, uh, and then all of her friends in our like, lo local little town started becoming my friend on Facebook as well. And, uh, and I'm a, I'm a attention-craving comedian, so you wanna be friends on Facebook? We can be friends on Facebook after this, it's fine. I'm, I'm friends with everyone. I'm, I'll say yes to anyone. I'm friends with schools, I'm friends with parks and everything. We, we can all be friends on, this, uh, on Facebook after this. We can make a group called We Went to John's Shit Show and, uh, and whatever you wanna do, we, we, can, we can do that. But uh, all of our friends started becoming my friends on Facebook and, uh, and some of them have very interesting Facebook status updates. So I made a poem about it. It's called Christy Sullivan Says, a tribute to actual Facebook status updates by my dad's foster child's best friend. <laughs> Christy Sullivan says, you watch me wash dishes, do laundry and sweep mop the floors, yet you still ask what I'm doing. I'm screwing, up, cr I'm screwing Papa Smurf, what's it look like, Lola Mayo? Is that's how I roll, smiley face? <laughs> Christy Sullivan says, I so fucking over people judging me and fucking two-faced. It don't matter what you fucking say. I'm so fucking over the bullshit head games and lies. I'm going to stay friends with the ones I know love me for being me. And the rest can go to fucking hell. It's my life, not yours. So keep the fucking bullshit to yourself. I'm overhearing it back. Have the balls to say it to my face, you dogs. That's how I roll. <laughs> Theresa K says, well said, babe. <laughs> so like I said, I've taken you through the disappointments where every time you think your dad is dead, it's not all those times as well. You think about the good times as well. When you go back through all these memories, every single time that I thought he was dying, I go back through all these memories. So to even it up, I'll take you through one of these not disappointing dad number four when I bought a house. So when I was about 20, four years old, I'd moved to Melbourne by this stage and, uh, and me and my girlfriend at the time decided that we were going to buy a house together. And we bought this house and I told my dad and uh, he got very excited. He came over to Melbourne, he helped me with the entire process of getting a loan and, and everything like that. And then we bought this house and, and he helped me renovate this house. And we spent about three weeks together just, just renovating this old house. And it was this really great time in our relationship, just me and dad for three weeks working together on this, on this house. And I just remember the day that he said, I'm happy that you bought a house. And it was this beautiful moment in our relationship. It was probably the first time I, I felt that my dad was, was properly proud of me and, and, and it was this really beautiful moment in our, in our relationship. Disappointing dad number 36, selling the house. So uh, <laughs> after about 10 months, my girlfriend and I decided that we hated each other's fucking guts. I hated her, she hated me. We should have never have bought a house together. That was a stupid idea and, uh, and it wasn't, I had this weird little breakdown and I, and I thought, you know, no, this is, not what, this is not what I'm about. This is not what I want to do. So I, I broke up with her. I'd stopped doing comedy by this stage and, and I, I had a well-paid government job and everything like that and, and, and all that sort of thing. And, and I had this little weird breakdown and said, this isn't for me. And, and I quit my job and, and I broke up with her and I, I sold the house and I used the money that I, that I made from, from selling the house to, to do a little thing called pretending things are a cock and that's just where I traveled around the world making cocks of things there's now a book and a, and a popular website and that's what I did for the next two years just traveled around the world making cocks of things I went to Africa I, I went to Kuala Lumpur I, I went to New York City I traveled all around the world for this thing just making cocks of stuff I went to Machu Picchu I went to the salt flats in, in Bolivia I went to Japan I went to Brazil I went to Singapore I traveled all around the world doing this thing and I went to Paris I went to Scotland and I started doing festivals and it became this popular thing and now I do a show, I did a show here a couple of weeks ago called Pretending Things Are a Cock, I went to a place called Car Penis in Romania, that's a real place that exists and I travelled all around the world doing this, this thing and it, and it just became this, this popular thing and then people started sending me photos of them making cocks of things, firemen started, I get sent photos like this all the time, army men were doing it, people in their own houses were making cocks of things, people on their own travels around the world started sending me pictures of them pretending things are a
a guy gets in photos like this every single day. I met, I met David Hasselhoff through pretending things are a cock. I met Joffrey from Game of Thrones through pretending things are a cock. And that's what I did, and I still do it now. I travel around the world making things my cock. It's now a book, it's this popular website, it's a show, and that's what I do now. That's what people know me as. I'm the cock guy. People stop me in the street and say, hey, you're the cock guy, and that's what I am. That's what I do now. I'm the cock guy. <laughs> and Dad was never proud. <laughs> of this life decision. In fact, my brother told me that every pretend cock that my dad sees, he dies a little bit on the inside. So if we count those deaths, there's well over 373. Part two. Christy Sullivan says, I have all my stuff back, you fucking dog. Everything I made a list. And I want everything that I move in with. If I find anything missing, you'll be missing your fucking head. Start on me, mole, because I want to have you bad. Give me more reasons than mayo! <laughs> Jason Webster says, are you free next Wednesday? <laughs> Death number 12, Kangaroo Island, so... When I was about 23 years old, I, uh, I, I, uh, my, my brother, my second oldest brother, Alf, moved to a place called Kangaroo Island, which is just off the coast of South Australia. It's shaped like a giant kangaroo, it's not really, but it's, uh, it's this place called Kangaroo Island. And my brother moved there, and uh, my dad went to visit him and just fell in love with Kangaroo Island. My dad has not been anywhere else outside of South Australia, but he loves Kangaroo Island. And, uh, and he always has the same excuses, like, why would I want to go anywhere else in the world? Kangaroo Island is right there. And he loves Kangaroo Island, it's this beautiful, natural wonderland, and, uh, and he loves Kangaroo Island so much. And, you know, I'd say to him, you know, Dad, I've been to Japan and things like that. And he'd go, why do I need to go to Japan? I've seen Japanese people on Kangaroo Island. Why do I need to go to Japan? <laughs> and he loves Kangaroo Island. He went and visited my brother so much. He visited him every single weekend that uh, my dad actually ended up getting a job on Kangaroo Island on Sundays as a minister at the local church in Kangaroo Island. And, uh, and then he got another job after church uh, with all the farmers and, and hunters going hunting these wild pigs on Kangaroo Island, the only introduced species on Kangaroo Island, and, and hunting these, these pigs. And, and I went to visit my, my brother, and, uh, and we went to church on the Sunday morning, and, and Dad was doing the sermon, and then after the sermon, he shook my hand, and he said, did you enjoy the service, young man? I said, fuck, Dad, you know who I am. Come on, I'm 23 now. And, uh, and he said, do you want to come hunting with me after church? I go hunting with these, with these farmers and everything. Do you want to come hunting? And I said, uh, no, I'm, I'm okay. And he said, do you just want to come and check it out? It's this, this beautiful national park, and, and it's, really, it's a really beautiful area. You just want to come and have a look. And then I said, okay, I'll, I'll come and check out this, this national park. And so we drove to this national park, and there was a big shed out the front. Where, and I walked into this shed, and there were all these farmers just, just sort of loading up these utes with guns and then driving off into the national park and going hunting. And, uh, and my dad said again, he said, are you sure you don't want to come? It's really fun. And, and I said, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. And, uh, and then he, uh, one of his mates, this big Aussie bloke, just sidled up next to me and just said, what are you, one of those vegetarians or something? <laughs> and I said, well, yes. Yes, I'm a vegetarian, but uh, I, I'm a sustainable vegetarian. I believe in sustainability and that you're killing these pigs, which are an introduced species, and I believe in what you're doing is, is good for the environment, and that's why I'm a vegetarian. It's, it's got nothing to do with the me thing or anything like that. And I, I had this really like intense conversation about sustainability and, and that sort of thing with an ethical vegetarianism and everything with this, with this big Aussie bloke to which he responded with, oh, you're a gay lord. <laughs> and this really affected me a little bit. I was like, was quite a homophobic remark and everything like that. And I got a little bit upset by this. And my dad was just like, don't worry, don't worry about that. Just, just, just help me load up this, this ute with guns. And, uh, and he handed me a gun. And, uh, and I don't know if you've ever held a gun before. But it's fucking awesome. <laughs> and I feel the weight of this gun. And I just go, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's shoot something. Let's let's shoot something. I wanna I wanna kill something. And, and my dad goes, great, great. Let's let's go hunting. And so I load up this this ute with guns, and just me and dad drive off in this ute off into this national park. And we park the ute, and we're just walking through this national park, just hunting these wild pigs. And after about three hours, dad has shot six pigs. I have shot none. I enjoy looking through the scope at things and looking at things far away, like birds and stuff like that. I like, I like pretending to shoot things and going pew, 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 like that sort of, <laughs> sort of thing. And, and I'm really having a great time with this. I'm really enjoying the, the thing. And, and Dad is getting very annoyed because he keeps thinking that, I, that I'm going to shoot something when I'm not. And he's telling me that he's annoyed. And, and, uh, and, and, and finally, I, I, he gets really angry. And he goes, look, I'm angry. 
do you want to shoot something? And I say, no, Dad, I'm having a great time. I feel like I'm in Predator or something like this. I, I'm really enjoying it because I'm hiding behind trees and jumping out and things like that. I'm having a great time. And, and, and he goes, nope, nope, nope. I'm going to find you something to shoot. And he disappears off into these bushes and he comes back about 10 minutes later and he just whispers, I found you something. And I see a pig. And it is a big pig. And it is asleep. And it has a bunch of little babies just suckling to its teats. And I'm staring at this pig through my sights and my dad just whispers into my ear, he goes, it's easy. <laughs> and I go, I know it's easy, dad, but this is, a, this is a bit fucked, don't you think? And he says, there's no need for that language. <laughs> and I say, no, I don't understand. Do I have to shoot the babies as well? And he goes, no, just shoot the mum, they'll die by themselves. And, and I sit there and I go, I can't, I can't do this. And dad, dad whispers in my ear again. He just goes, it's easy, you're helping. This is a sustainable thing that you're doing. These are a pest, they're an introduced species. You're helping, you can do this. And I think, okay, you know what? Man up, man up. And I remember his mate calling me this Gaylord thing and everything like that. And I think, nope, nope, I can do this. And I sit with this mother pig's head in my sights for what feels like an age. And then, and then I just go, nope, nope, man up, I'm doing this. I get its head in the sights, I close my eyes, and I pull the trigger. When I open my eyes, I see Dad's back in front of me. And I see it just drop to the right. And I have just shot Dad <laughs> in the back. <laughs> and he stood in front of me, I was hanging too long, he thought, he thought I was just mucking around, he thought I was going to do it, and jumped in front of me just as I pulled the trigger, and he swings around and holds his chest, and his blood comes out from between his, his fingers, he just looks at me and just says, you fucking shot me! <laughs> and it's the first time I've heard him swear, and again, that, li that little thing in the back of my brain just wants to go, there's no need for that language, but I don't say anything like that, and he just unleashes this tirade of abuse, just, you fucking shot me, I am fucking dead, do you know where we are, I am fucking dead, you have fucking killed me, and then he says, then he goes, he pulls out his phone and he throws it at me, he says, call mum, call mum, tell you've killed me and I'm dead, <laughs> and I stumble with the phone, and then, he, and then he says, I can't believe it's you. Out of all of my sons, you're the one who kills me. <laughs> the vegetarian. <laughs> the city boy. Tim is in jail. My brother Tim's in jail. Tim is in jail. And you're the son who kills me. And I get the phone and, and, I, and I dial triple zero. I don't call mum, I'm not an idiot. And I dial triple zero and I say, I just shot my, shot my dad. And, uh, and they say, where are you? And I say, Kangaroo Island. And they say, we need you to be a bit more specific. Than that, and I say, I don't know. We're in a national park. There's trees and everything, and they go, I think, I think we can tell where you are. There's a property about a k away. Do you think you can get your dad to this property? And I say, Yeah, yeah. I, I think he seems okay. And 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 so I hang up from them, and uh, and then Dad turns to me and, he, and I tell him we got to go to this property, and he says, Give me your jumper. And I take off my jumper, and he uses the sleeve from my jumper to stuff into a fucking hole in his chest and he screams with pain and I've got to put my arm around me and hold the jumper into his chest as we walk back to where we've parked the ute. I put dad in the passenger side of the ute. I run around to the driver's side. I start the ute up and I can't drive a manual car. <laughs> and this is a big old ute with one of these things on the steering wheel and all I do is I grind it into a gear and we bounce forward and stop and dad screams in pain. I start it up again. We bounce forwards and stop and dad screams again and then turns to me and says, get out. <laughs> and I get out of the car and walk around to the passenger side as dad slides along the seat, leaving this trail of blood along the back of the seat and drives himself <laughs> to this property. And we're driving, as, as a short driver, we're driving and all they've told me on the triple zero line is just to make sure he stays awake, which is good now that he's driving. And so I'm just <laughs> making sure he's awake. And by the time we get to this property, he's gone this purple, grey colour and the, the helicopter is there and they load Dad out of the ute. They load him in the back of the helicopter and I go to get in the back of the helicopter and they say, no, 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 we've organised for a flight home for you and your family. You need, to, you need to go back to your brother's house. We've organised a flight. We need to take him right now. And the helicopter takes off and I'm left to drive the ute home. <laughs>
and all I do is I, I start it up, I grind it into a gear, and I just stay in that gear the entire way back to my brother's house, and the engine is screaming. I don't understand why the engine is so loud, but we're not going very fast at all, just, just screaming down these roads. And so by the time I get to my brother's house, it's been about 45 minutes now, and I pull up out the front of my brother's house, and everyone is gone. My mum's gone, my brother's gone, my brother's wife, everyone, everyone is gone, and dad's mate, who called me a gay lord, is just standing on the front veranda of my brother's house. And again, this thing clicks in, my, in the back of my brain and I see his mate and I just want to go, who's a fucking gay lord now? I just shot the fucking dad. How do you feel about that? <laughs> but, I, but I don't say anything and, the, and this man, he's there to take me to the airport and he says, you're too late. And, the, and he drives me to the airport and I get on this plane and I fly over to the, to the mainland and I go to the hospital where my dad is in and he's in surgery for about five hours. And my mum comes out after five hours and says, he's going to be okay. He's just lost his collarbone. And uh, when he got to hospital, he only had something like two litres of blood left in his body. And uh, she says, he's going to be okay. He's, he's recovering from surgery. Do you want to go and visit him? And I say, <laughs> no, because I just can't. I just, I just can't do it. I, I'm really ashamed and, and everything like that. And my mum says, that's okay, that's okay. We've organised some counselling for you and everything like that. He's going to be in hospital for about a month. You can visit him another time. It, it's fine. And we understand that you, you know, you're suffering from shock and everything like that. And I see this counsellor and everything. And I'm going to university at the time. And dad is in hospital for, for a month. And I don't go and visit him. And I just can't. I can't do it. And uh, the counsellor keeps telling me that I need to go and visit him. And my mum is calling me up every day, just saying, asking me if I visited dad. And sometimes I lie and say I have when I haven't. And uh, my dad is only in hospital for another week. And my mum calls me up and she says, you need to go and visit him. If you do not go and visit him, this could be the worst thing you've ever done in your life. And I say, pretty sure it is the worst thing I've done in my life. Mum, I haven't shot a baby or anything like that. I'm pretty sure shooting your dad in the back is one of the worst things that you can do in your life. But, but she's right and the counsellor's right and I decide, yes, I'll go and visit him. And uh, so I go to the shops and there's, there's not really a card that you can buy that says, sorry, I shot you, dad. But Paul Mark, don't make that one yet. And I think it needs a bigger gesture anyway, but I'm a poor student and everything. So I go to this electronic shop and I buy a Tele Funkin' DVD player. <laughs> and I just walk into my dad's hospital room, he's just lying in the bed and I, and I put the DVD player on the end of his bed and I just say, now you can watch DVDs while you're in hospital, dad. And see, he says, it's a DVD player attached to the television. <laughs> Part three. <laughs> he was fine. <laughs> I shot the pig through him, no one ever mentions that. <laughs> Christy Sullivan says, WTF, move the fuck on you dog fuck Chaz, you're the one that dogged me over now and again with f calls and treating message, saying you coming to get me will bring it fucking on as I know if and when you show up on my doorstep, out will come the baseball bat and I smash your knees, then call the cops and I call that Karam. <laughs> So fuck off, last warring. <laughs> Christy Sullivan says, I sure I was swapped at birth as I'm sure I have a mum out there that's not a heartless cunt like I have. <laughs> Kirsty Wilson says, are you going to come to my wedding? <laughs> the last step. So I've been travelling around the world doing this, this pretending things are a cock thing and, uh, and I go back to the Adelaide Fringe. And at the Adelaide Fringe, they offer me uh, an art gallery. And they want me to blow up all the, all the pretending things are a cock photos, frame them, and have a fucking pretending things are a cock art gallery. And I can't believe this is happening, but I say yes, and I have this big exhibition opening for this art gallery, and it's this amazing thing. I get this classical cellist to play at the opening, and we serve cock-shaped hors d'oeuvres and everything like that, and, and all my friends come in like tuxedos and everything, and, and, uh, and I invite all my friends and family, and everyone comes except for dad. Now this really upsets me. This really, really upsets me. Because you know, we've been through enough now and I'm older and everything like that. And I can't believe it. I'm actually quite proud of this thing by now. I put a lot of work into it and, and everything like that. And I can't believe he, he wouldn't come to it. And I, I'm really upset and I, and I say to my mum, why, why wouldn't he come? And mum just says, you know what? To be honest, he, 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 don't, he just doesn't like it. He doesn't like it. And, and to be honest, he, he's, he's embarrassed by it. And that, that just hurts me even more, the, the, the thought that my own dad is, 
is embarrassed by me. And, and I get really, really upset. And I, and I say to my mum, like, what, what can I do? Like, what can I do about this? And, and mum says, you know what? You haven't been back to the farm for like three years. Why don't you just go back to the farm and visit dad and talk to him? And I agree. I say, yep, okay, that's, that's what I'll do. So I, uh, the next day I, I, I rent a car, uh, an automatic, and I, and I drive <laughs> to my parents' farm out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I'm driving down a long, winding, driveway and I give it a halfway down the driveway and I look out into the paddock and I see the tractor. And the tractor is in the middle of the paddock stopped and then there's just a body lying beneath the tractor covered completely in a blanket. And it's got to be dad. It's got to be dad. None of the other brothers live at home. It's, it's got to be him. And I look out the windshield of the car and my mum is running down the driveway towards my car and there's an ambulance coming down the driveway behind me. And I go back through all these memories and these thoughts that every time you think your dad is dead, the disappointments and everything like that. And I think about the time and I, and I, and I think, you know, this is the last thing. You, you do a cock exhibition, he's embarrassed by you. That's his last disappointment for you. That's the last memory that he's got of you before he dies. And I start crying and everything. And then I think about the good times and everything like that. And I, and I think about the last time I spoke to dad. And it was when I called him on the phone the day before to organize to come back to the farm and, and I was talking to him on the phone and I, and I couldn't help it. I said, you know what, Dad, I'm really disappointed that you didn't come to my show. And, uh, and I said to him, you know what, it, it, it's not what you think anymore. I know it sounds puerile and that sort of thing, but, but the tour that I do of the gallery and everything, it's a storytelling show, Dad. I've stopped doing that stand-up sort of stuff that you don't like and I tell stories now, Dad. I talk about growing up on the farm and, and everything like that and traveling around the world doing this thing and it's actually, it's a storytelling thing, Dad, and I think you'd actually like it. It's a little bit like Banjo Patterson, Dad. It's not like Banjo Patterson, but it's a little bit like, like Banjo Patterson, Dad, and that's what you wanted me to be and I think you would actually enjoy it. And Dad says, yeah, my mum has told me, and I, and I do think that sounds like something that I would enjoy. And I say, see, this is what I mean, and I'm so disappointed. And he said, oh, I've got a story for you. And I said, great, great, Dad, tell me your, your story. And, and he said, it's a story with a moral. And I said, oh, great. <laughs> and I said, what is it, from the Bible or something like that? I've heard enough of them. And he goes, no, 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 it's a story I heard on Kangaroo Island. And I'll leave you with this story that my dad told me on this day over the phone. It's a story about this guy on Kangaroo Island, this pilot on Kangaroo Island who flies this little aircraft over the ocean to Adelaide. And, uh, and he, he flies his, his airlines all the time and uh, one of the farmers on Kangaroo Island asks the pilot if he flies crop dusting plane over the ocean so he can sell it. And the pilot agrees, he gets a little bit of money and he says to the farmer, is it going to make the flight? And the farmer says, yep, it's a bit old and dusty, it's just been sitting in my shed for about a year, but it'll definitely make the flight. And so the pilot agrees, he gets a little bit of money, and he's flying this tiny little aircraft over the ocean to Adelaide from Kangaroo Island. And he's about halfway along on this flight when he sees this movement on the wing, this flap lifting up on the, on the wing of the plane. And he turns around, he goes, oh God, the, the farmer has given me a dud plane, something's wrong with the wing, like, there's nothing I can do about it, but I can't believe it. He said it was going to make the flight, there's something wrong with the wing, there's nothing I can do, I have to keep flying. And he keeps flying, and then he sees this thing climb out from under the flap, and it's a possum. And this possum has climbed out from under this flap and is just gripping hold of the wing for dear life. There's leaving scratch marks down the side of the wing and the pilot's like, oh God, it's a, it's a possum. There's nothing I can do about that. He's going to fly off that sab, but, but it's going to bring the value down to the plane. The scratch marks, but the, there's nothing I can do. I just need to keep flying as long as there's nothing wrong with the wing. And he keeps flying the plane, but he can't help but notice out of his peripheral vision that the possum is now making its way up the wing towards him until he's flying the plane and the possum is here, just staring in through the window, just <laughs> death in its face, just holding on for dear life in the wind. And he's going, oh God, you just hold on little guy. You can make this flight. You can make this flight. Just hold on. Just stay there. If you make this flight, I'll set you free in the wilderness and you've a good little possum life. Just hold on. I have to keep flying the plane. And he keeps flying the plane and then he sees this little furry arm come around the front of the plane into the possum is spread eagle across the windshield of the plane getting pushed against the windshield by the wind eyes wide just staring the pilot dead in the face death in its eyes holding on for dear life and the pilot's like you can do this little guy you can make this flight just hold on as he tries to fly in between the gaps between the possum's arms and legs and he's getting right near the Adelaide airport which is just on the beach and he brings the landing gear down he comes down through the clouds and he goes you can do it little guy I'm not going to set you free in the windows I'm going to take you home to my little kids you're going to be their pet you're going to have the best little possum life just hold on and he comes down just over the ocean and he says you have done it little guy you have made it. And he gives the possum a little pat through the windshield of the plane. And finally, the possum's eyes relax and close. And then the possum releases <laughs> and flies off into the ocean below.
So my dad is telling me this story on this, this phone, and I'm like, what the fuck is that? What is that? And, and then I just think, what the fuck is the moral to that story? How does that have a, have a moral? And dad had made up a moral for his little possum story that he heard, and I'll leave you with this moral as well. It's never make your home in an aeroplane's engine bay. That's the moral to my dad's <laughs> possum story. I'm sitting in my car just thinking about all these times and I'm, I'm crying and I, and, I, and I think to myself and then I have this revelation. And it's just this revelation because I think that's the first time my dad has even actually made me laugh. And I have this revelation which is just, your parents are just people. They're just people and you don't need to build them up onto this pedestal or anything. And there comes a time in your adult life where you, where you start saying you don't have to get along. And you know what, I never questioned my dad's love for me. Never once did I think that my dad didn't love me. And I think to be a good parent, that's all you need. That's all that needs to happen is your kids need to know that they're loved. And, uh, and I never questioned dad's love for me. I always knew that he loved me. And that's all, that's, and, I, and, I, and I loved him back and that's all, that's all I care about. And a couple of days later, I'm going through my parents' DVD collection and I find this blank DVD and I put it in their DVD player, the Telly Funkin one I bought them on that day, and, and I put it in and I find this. I'd like to read to you a poem called I Love Dogs and I Love You, written by John Dead. I love dogs and I love you. Dogs have wet tongues and you do too. I like it when a dog licks me. I don't like it when I'm bit by a bee. I can call my dog a bitch and she doesn't mind. You call me bitch when you smack my behind. My dog doesn't smack me, it just shakes hands. My dog begs and never makes demands. I love dogs and I love you, but at least I don't have to pick up your poo. My dog is like Kimmy Gibbler from Full House and Chuck from Goonies combined into a dog who is dead. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming out. So, I've already gone over time. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the epilogue. So I'm sitting in my car in the middle of the driveway and by this time my mum has reached the car and is just banging on the side window. I've just had this revelation and I'm crying. The ambulance has pulled up right behind me in the, in the driveway and, I, and I'm sitting in my car and I wind down the window and my mum leans into the window. She's covered in sweat and she leans in and catches her breath and just says, Dad's done his back. <laughs> and I say, what? He said, Dad's done his back, he's done it really bad, he did it trying to lift the tractor or something and he's done it really bad, that's, that's why the, the ambulance is here and I say, Why the fuck did you pull the blanket over his head for, Mum? Why would you do that? You know how this is for me, you know how I think he's dying all the time. I've just had this big revelation about you guys just being people and, and knowing that I was loved and all that kind of bullshit. Why would you do that, Mum? And she just says, Dad was cold. <laughs> So my dad is still alive, he probably will be for many years to come now and he's, he's retired now and we've talked a lot and, and we've got a bit of a better relationship now. We understand that we don't see eye to eye on most things but, but we talk every day and everything like that and uh, he called me up the other day and told me that he's friends with lesbians. I don't know why he told me that but he, 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 we talk quite often and, and we have quite a good relationship and, uh, and uh, he's, re he's retired now and uh, I've, actually, uh, I've actually brought him over to Perth for this run of shows and he's, he's, uh, he's sitting up the, up the back here, uh, at the big here. Oh no, 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 he still, he still never comes to my shows, he still, he's not there. Thanks very much guys. <laughs>